like Daniel said, I'm going to talk, really I'm going to tell two stories, okay? And so I don't want anybody to be afraid. We're going to talk about science. But we're going to talk about it in a way that I think is fun, all right? And really this first story starts, I know it's with something you haven't really wanted to think about since you were probably in high school, and that's chemistry. More specifically, biochemistry. And really this story starts with, with asking the question, how is it that this agglomeration of cells evolves in time in such a way that through seemingly a complex and uncoordinated process, these cells somehow miraculously turn into this. <laughs> There's an important lesson here, okay? I'm defriending you today. <laughs> <laughs> the lesson here is that you don't end up looking this good by mistake. The lesson here is that biology isn't random, okay? It's highly deterministic. It's what we call in the business regulated, okay? And to prove and illustrate this point, I will make the claim that when little Daniel, little baby Daniel was born, Mr. and Mrs. Hausman didn't worry if Daniel was gonna turn into, say, I don't know, a llama. And the reason, the reason is because chemistry, or biochemistry specifically, Okay, it, it doesn't make mistakes, okay? And to really illustrate this point, I'm gonna bring up something that, well, you probably haven't seen one of these since before Justin Bieber was born. <laughs> but the periodic table tells us a lot of really interesting things. And in particular, it tells us about some properties of the underlying molecules here, or in this case, elements. And as you go from left to right, it turns out that there's a property of atoms, and it's called electronegativity. I know it's a boring word. But what that basically means is as you go left to right, the relative reactivity of these elements increases. Okay? And so as your eyes wander over to the right, what you're going to notice is that all the way over there, all the way, way over on the right, is oxygen. And oxygen is a highly reactive element. And this is a little bit strange because biology requires team players. Okay? You can't just you can't just go rogue if you're working in the context of a cell. That creates huge, huge problems. And so it turns out that the most important molecule, oxygen, is actually a huge problem. Basically, in every single cell in your body, there's something called mitochondria. Mitochondria is basically where you metabolize oxygen. You turn it into, essentially, energy, the energy that you use to sustain yourself. And the more you live, the more you eat, the more you breathe, the more you create a byproduct of this metabolic process, and it's, they're called reactive oxygen species, another boring word. And they, they sound exactly, or they are exactly what they sound like. Okay? They're highly reactive, and they cause huge problems in the context of a cell that needs everybody working together. Specifically, this theory of aging states the following. It states that the more we age, or the longer we live, rather, Okay, the more we create these reactive oxygen species, and the more we impair the underlying cellular function, so that with time, we accumulate more and more of these reactive oxygen species, which have a really familiar name to all of us. They're called radicals. I don't think there's anybody in this room that hasn't made a dietary decision or some kind of a consumer decision that's somehow influenced by the concept of, or the existence of these free radicals in our, in our bodies. Um, and that's the end of that story. <laughs> so the second story, we'll come back to that. I'll try to summarize all of this. I think, I think at the end of the day, really, what I want to emphasize with this first concept of how or why we age, it's the idea that life is something we put on sort of, I like to use the analogy of, like it's like a castle on top of a mountain. And death is sort of like the barbarian horde at the bottom of this mountain that's sort of just fighting to make its way to the top until it overwhelms the castle defenses and, well, and we die. Morbid, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The second story is really fascinating, okay? It starts in 1951 with that woman on the left. Her name is Henrietta Lacks, and she was 31 years old when she went to a doctor at Johns Hopkins University. She was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And she actually died, tragically, about three months later, but not before a biopsy of her cancer tumor made its way to the guy over on the right, that researcher, his name was George Gay. 
Okay? And it helps to give you a little bit of context about what was going on in 1951. Okay? In 1951, you just had the emergence of all these amazing and miraculous things. I mean, in particular, you just have the widespread adoption of antibiotics, particularly penicillin. You have the dissemination of, uh, of vaccines, in particular the smallpox vaccine, which was going to, within 25 years, effectively eradicate human disease in human diseases that had proven to be scourges of humanity of human civilization for millennia and maybe even most important in 1952 you had the complete structural characterization of that molecule that you see on the left and that's DNA but there was one really important piece of the puzzle that was missing and that was to put all of this together researchers needed to take human tissue or human cells and they needed to be able to grow them in a petri dish and the idea, of course, is just they wanted to be able to study human biology. And scientists are trying and trying for several years, and nobody succeeds until 1951, when George Gay becomes the first researcher to culture human cells in a Petri dish. And they turned out to be Henrietta Lacks uh, cancer cells, and he gave them the name HeLa cells. And today, 60 years later, uh, it's said that there are about 60,000 research papers that are reporting discoveries that are made using HeLa cells as the, as the model system. A few years later, Jonas Salk would test the polio vaccine on HeLa cells. You can probably safely say that everything we know about human biology, to some extent, can indirectly, indirectly uh, be attributed to the fact that George Gay was able to culture human, to, uh, culture human cells in a Petri dish that day in 1951. And the question you might be asking yourself is, what the hell am I talking about? What does this have to do with aging? Well, it turns out there's a really interesting thing going on. And this interesting thing is what made it possible to culture those tumor cells. In every single one of your cells, when your cells have to divide, you have a copy of your genome. Okay? And, those, and your genome is packaged into something called chromosomes, and you have 23 of them. So every time your cell has to divide, it copies your whole genome in a process that is highly, highly regulated. There are tons of proteins, tons of accessory molecules that, are, that ensure that this process is highly, highly accurate and has high, high fidelity. And yet, as people studied this process over time, people started noticing that in normal, healthy human tissue cells, the ends of your chromosomes, which are in red over here on the, on the right side, they actually get shorter with time. And this is an almost incomprehensibly ridiculous thing. I mean, how is it possible that something we spend so much time trying to ensure accurate propagation is actually almost losing information as time goes on? Now, the really interesting part of this story is that when you look at a tumor cell and you look at what are called telomeres, that's the ends of your chromosomes, they don't get any shorter. And so in Henrietta Lacks' cells, what's going on is that there's an actual protein that is just preserving the tips of, the t of, of her chromosomes. Okay? And that actually happens in pretty much every cancer cell that we know of today. Now what happens over time is if your chromosome is losing information at the edges, after dividing a certain number of times, eventually your cells have impaired function and you die. And so the really interesting thing about this, and I want to make sort of a contrast between the two different models that I've described here about how and why we age. If you think about how we live as sort of the running of a computer program, well, the weird thing about what the telomere story tells us is that death is itself part of the program. And it's a really fundamentally different way to think about the relationship between life and death compared to the first compared to the first story that I told. Um, so I'm just going to sort of like end the talk with four different, uh, I guess, facts. Uh, the first thing is that part of the application of this re the research into the understanding of the telomeres uh, has resulted in experiments that show, for example, that in worms, if you actually upregulate the production of this protein that protects the tips of your chromosomes, you can actually extend the life of a worm by about 30%. No big deal, right? Turns out that the story of Henrietta Lacks was last year made into a book 
and that book is called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It was one of the top 10 bestsellers on Amazon.com. Highly recommend it as a read. The woman responsible for this research into understanding the shortening of your chromosomes, that woman, her name is Elizabeth Blackburn, and she won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2009. And uh, I guess that's it. I'm kind of blanking. Thanks. <laughs>